This is the Page Publishing Book Club. How you doing? I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Dr. Bill Bronston was a medical director in California for 25 years before he started working on legislation to establish universal health care for the entire state. He also found time to write about a very important time in his life during the 70s in New York when he was able to inspire significant change. And that is the subject of his book, Public Hostage, Public Ransom, Ending Institutional America. I was working at this horrendous place, which was really an American concentration camp for people with mental retardation and developmental disabilities, the largest of its kind that existed in the country. There were 6,000 broken people that were incarcerated at this horrible place where they were essentially put to die and monetized as a result of their conditions. The state would collect Medicaid money reimbursement which were, was essentially maximized based on how the state decided to diagnose people. And, and so they just kept people there and, and brought money in, in the, in the tens of millions of dollars. There was no alternative in the state of New York except large institutions. There were no community-based services in the state of New York when this all began. And uh, my training had been at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles after I finished you know, my, my, my medical training in child development. And so at a certain point, I was looking for work. And I figured that with my background in in child development, that I could work at this institution for people with mental retardation. The struggle at Willowbrook that I essentially coordinated changed everything in the country. It It was a titanic transformational struggle that happened there, where we essentially confronted the state of New York and the governor for crimes against humanity using the federal court and organized parents, organized progressive workers, people that were working in the academies, training people in special education, lawyers. It was an enormous, enormous struggle, which was essentially popped when Geraldo Rivera, who at that time had just gotten a job at ABC television, came to the institution where I was working and did an expose that absolutely blew the lid off of New York television at the time. He, he, he came in a number of times over a period of about two months in order to follow the atrocities and the, and the essential response on the part of the state of New York for what was going on there. And it, it follows through the arc of the story, comes through 2022, where what we're looking at is the continuation of public financing for out-of-home, congregate, segregated residential services for devalued and dependent people in society. They're called elders, you and I, when we get older. And by the way, I'm going to be 83, and I'm a full-time organizer, but I'm a physician, and I'm working in healthcare policy. The fact of the matter is that even though we no longer have a preponderance of large, congregate, segregated, residential institutions, the same money is being essentially expended to institutionalize the rest of the population as we age into nursing homes, into assisted living, into hospice systems, which is all Medicaid funded. That river of money is the source of an institutional culture which we suffer in America. And were we to essentially end Medicaid and replace it with a universal rightful healthcare system where there was no out-of-pocket expenditure and people could plan to essentially provide uh, terminal services for everybody on an individualized basis, we would not have the kind of crisis that we have in our society of institutionalization. Most people that don't have adequate dollars or don't have the kind of supportive families wind up forced to put their their relatives, their dependent relatives, into institutions. And so my, my book essentially deals with the heart of all of that issue, how it was happening nationwide. 
Scary stuff, Dr. Bronston, but definitely some uh, something to think about. Thank you so much. Nobody tells a story like April Finn Loving, an RN for 52 years. She came to the U.S. from Ireland, and a doctor she worked with encouraged her to write, even bought her a bound notebook to get her started. She has now completed her second book in a trilogy entitled Angela's Purse. So bring us up to speed. The first book was called The Closed Line. And it was based really on my fascination with Irish damp weather and the people's fixation of drying the clothes outside, even if you own a dryer. I mean, that's just what you do. You hang them out. God forbid you put it into a dryer. Shame on you. It's got to take forever for stuff to dry over there. Forever. So it was in, it was out. There was a language built all around it, soaking wet, sopping wet, bone dry. I mean, really, it it was very important how you spoke about your clothes. Okay. So as I was writing it, it began to dawn on me, me through the character, that a clothesline is like a day in our life. But sometimes your day doesn't have a nice thing. And unlike a clothesline where if it's torn you can discard it or whatever things happen in your life that you cannot discard you have to deal with them so the clothesline took a little twist and now the second book angela's purse is a sequel to that the main character in the first book is a 10 year old child and we're following her through now through a cancer treatment okay and uh, she's she's on her way and doing very well so that's the sequel so angela's purse is called that because the people of the town of Baybridge, which is very tightly based on my hometown of Sligo, and the people were just very generous with her and set up a foundation by a man one day who said, are they collecting money for the little girl? Well, where's the purse? And it became Angela's purse. I mean, that's loosely how that came about. So, um, so it's following her through and how her neighbors helped her and, and her, her own and her sister, she's 10, her sister is six, how their simplicity just made it easier on the adults. They were actually the strong ones. It was just amazing to watch them develop and how they would simplify everything. Children have a very simple way and uncomplicated, like you don't have to climb Mount Kilimanjaro to get there. You know, you could just go in a straight line and there it is. So they, they taught the adults to just take it easy. Just let's go this way. Yeah. There's another big thing that came to mind with me too, is the relationship between doctors and nurses. Her GP, Dr. Owned, is a very, very astute, um, kind man. And he understood the relationship between the doctor and the nurse and, and the rest of his staff. And he states that he would be useless as a doctor and be not effective at all if he didn't have respect and trust, especially for his nursing staff, because, you know, doctors write orders and they walk away. It's the nurses that carry them out. And if they're not carried out correctly at the bedside or in the home or wherever you are, you will not have a good outcome. So really his success with his patients was very dependent on his nursing staff. So that was something that I had thought about subconsciously for years. Um, but it, the pen allowed me to get it out there, which was quite, quite nice. A few foundations actually sprung out of the fundraising for this girl. And she subsequently actually becomes a doctor herself and a pediatric oncologist. So the the little girl does make it. Yes, she does. And we find out how this impacted her life as it unfolds. Absolutely, indeed. Indeed, yeah. And, and, all, and those around her, yes. All right, April, thank you. Elvis C. Foster is a computer science college professor in New Hampshire who examines and expresses his spiritual side in his book entitled Life, Essence of It All. Yeah, well, as I say in my preface, uh, that's why I'm so excited about it. It's a book about life written by a computer scientist drawing from philosophy and scriptures. It, it started as a childhood passion, really. I was a very observant child, and that just continued, so I would make notes about things I observe in life. Then I started sharing some of them with people, and they all seemed fascinated. And so that kind of buoyed me into say, okay, well, maybe there's a good uh, audience for this. So that's how it's all started. So um, it, it has 31 short uh, chapters. Each uh, begins with what people think about the topic. For instance, there's a topic on love. There's one on decision-making, how people make decisions. There's one on race relations. So in each case, I look at the problem. Then I try to give a philosophical perspective to it. 
And, uh, and then I try to draw from scripture about it as well. There's one about how people judge the world. There's one about friendship and relationships, communication, and so on. So there's something there for every curious mind. Give me an example. So love. Let's pick love. What do people mean when they say, I love you? Some people mean you have something I want, <laughs> right? Some people may mean, you know, I, I like the physical relationship with you. Uh, it means different things to different people. And so I look at that and then I look at it from a philosophical perspective. What do philosophers have to say about love? And then I end on what the scripture has to say about love. And uh, there, there's a beautiful passage in 1 Corinthians 13 that I quote. I, I haven't seen a better definition of love anywhere. Love is patient and kind. Exactly. The one that's read at every wedding. Yes, indeed. <laughs> but, you know, how many people really understand the depth of that, you know? Yeah, I have not seen a better definition or a more comprehensive one. Now, that's my favorite. That's my absolute favorite. Here's one I really like, the cycle of folly. <laughs> yeah, cycle of folly versus the cycle of wisdom. Uh, that's where I look at uh, how people get locked into their own uh, uh, perspective and sometimes they become a, vi a victim of that uh, instead of having a more open-minded approach. Um, so I look at that and... Um, and, and and also the, the real world is really a nice one to life and the real world real world chapter 15 where i just look at life uh you know what do you do when you get knocked down um and i make the observation that life is like a tough uh schoolmaster and if you get knocked down and you don't get up nobody gives you any attention but if they see that you're trying to get up you get a helping hand so i talk about that as well um, there's one about, uh, you know, uh, friend versus brother, uh, you know, how important is friendship in, in one's, uh, life and in one's relationship. Uh, so there's something there, I think for just about everybody, <laughs> you know, but I mean, it, it clearly you felt compelled to do this. You saw a need for this. Indeed I did. Yes. Um, but I have to tell you, um, just shortly after writing it, I, I discovered a, a problem very close to my own family. Uh, and when I say a problem, I mean a human problem, uh, where I, I discovered that someone very close to me actually needed something like this. And, uh, and so I was able to point that person to... Uh, to the book and to give them a copy of it, a complimentary copy. That's saying something, Elvis. Thank you. LaSonia Brown always wanted to be a writer, wound up being a teacher, and that inspired her first book. It's entitled Life is Not a Dress Rehearsal, My Journey in the Classroom as an Empath and Teacher. The interesting thing about it is, is when I was in the classroom, I actually discovered my empathic abilities when I was working with my students because I was the only teacher where every student would like just go nuts and cry. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, what's wrong? What's the problem? They were like, the students would just come up to me and cry or they would act up. And I would be like, I don't know what the problem is. And that's when I discovered what an empath was because because most people that I talked to, they didn't know anything about it. I don't think people believe they exist. Right. Basically, the response that I was getting when I was talking to people, they were like, what are you talking about? They're like they've heard the term being empathetic or having empathy for others, but they had no clue what I was talking about. They was like, huh? Well, when you say, you know, students would come up to you and they'd be crying, is that because they sensed something in you? I believe so. Yes. And then other students, like all of a sudden I would pick up on things that they were going through and I had no idea you know, about it until someone else said something to me. They were like, well, you know, they come from this type of home or they are in foster care or this, that, and the other. And I'm like, okay, that's what I was picking up. Do you have examples of that in your book? Yes, I do, actually. I had this one student where I was always, you know, trying to calm him down during the day. And, you know, like how they tell you, you have to reach your students, like, um, like greet them when you see them and make sure they have a good day. He was always very angry, and I was always picking up on it. 
everybody else would see him when he would come in. You know, every teacher has a duty every morning. And they would be like, oh, here comes your student. I was like, I, I hope it, anything isn't wrong with him, but I would feel it before I would get to him. And he was the oldest child of five children. He was given the responsibility to take care of all his brothers and sisters while his parents were. And you can imagine what that is like for a 10-year-old. 10 years old. Right. I was the only one that would pick up on He was angry about that. And boy, did he show it. And everyone else was like, well, you just need to handle him this way and that way. I'm like, that's not going to help. That's going to make it work. He was responsible for making sure they got their dinner when they got home, their snacks, because his parents were always working. Were you able to help him? Yeah, but this was like during my first year in teaching. They was like, you just need to leave that alone because nobody else is going to deal with it. But his parents were like, well, we didn't understand that there was too much. I'm like, how did you not understand there was too much for a 10-year-old? But, and then my, you know, the person that I was working for, my administrator told me, she was like, don't even get involved in it because they had other teachers. They had been shifting him from school to school, and it was like a bit too much for him. And it was like, a, yeah, a lot of people was like ignoring him. I'm like, how could you ignore, you know, things that are going on with children? But, yeah, it was a bit much for everybody involved. So you weren't really able to intervene? Mm-mm. Nope. The thing is, most people were like, well, if you work in the inner city or you work in a what is considered to be a lower socioeconomic area, they were like, well, we just do what we can and that's that. I'm like, but it, it, there has to be a change somewhere along the line because how can you continue to say that you care, but a lot of stuff is, is going undressed, you know, un, unaddressed in the system. So that, that's rough for a lot of teachers. That's what they face just about every day. But, you know, they just deal with it. Mm -hmm. Is that why you left teaching? Yep. My purpose is to let other empaths, or even if you aren't an empath, know that you don't have to deal with a toxic work environment, especially one where you're supposed to be supported and people claim that they support you and whatever you have to do with your students, even if you are a teacher. And then... They turn around and then they basically shut you down at every turn. So I just wanted the people to know that if you are experiencing something like this at work, for a lot of people they are, you're not alone. And you can make the decision that is best for you and best for your family without feeling like it's one over the other or like you're a bad person. For you. you know, that reminds me of the um, Eleanor Roosevelt quote, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Thanks, Lasagna. Here's one for you Dungeons and Dragons fans. Nicole Sherwood just finished her BA in business communications and it was boredom in college and her love for D&D that resulted in her book Forever Lost Fallen. Right after I finished high school, my brother and sister and I, we used to do D&D, really geeky. Um, <laughs> I had made a campaign for my younger brother and sister and we never got to play it. So while I was in between classes and bored because uh, I ran out of the style of books that I like to read, which is the the fantasy and stuff, I decided that since I wasn't able to run the campaign, I might as well, you know, write the campaign. So basically, I played all of the characters that were to be in the campaign, which is the ones that are in the book, and um, saw how it went. I liked it, so I made it into a book. It was basically just to entertain myself while I was, you know, the stress of college and stuff. The book follows the prince of the elves, the youngest son. The father doesn't know what to do with him because he was dealing with the grief of losing his first wife. And the second wife doesn't like him just because he's a little rebellious. He doesn't follow her rules and everything. And she sees him as just an annoyance. She doesn't want to be his mother because she's not his mother. And so she pushes him away. The father doesn't know what to do with him. And he is a little brat. He runs around because he's not paid attention to and gets himself into trouble. He meets up with a young girl that's his age and just terrorizes the town with little pranks. At the beginning of the book, a war had broken out with a cursed necklace. He actually finds it when he's picking through the rubble of their village um, after his best friend's father was killed. And he holds on to it for many years. He falls in love with his best friend. Uh, he gives it to her as a wedding gift. And the father realizes that it's the cursed necklace that's been plaguing their entire kingdom. He sends him on a quest to destroy it out of anger and rage. And the entire campaign is the young prince trying to destroy the uh, 
necklace while trying to keep his kingdom and his family intact. I'm working on the second book right now. It's a little darker than the first. You leave us hanging at the end of the first book? Kind of, yes. Uh, it, the ending can be taken two ways. If they, if no one wants to continue on, they can take the ending as they see it. Or if they want to read on to the second book, they can discover what further happens to the main character. If there's a whole creative community out there and they exchange ideas and they role play. And I can just see you being a part of that. Oh, it, it's very fun. I mean, everyone that they pick on it, but everybody in that in that area is like, they're so imaginative and so creative. I mean, like you have the people that the DM, the dungeon masters that they make these stories. And then like you have the, the people that play in the campaigns. I mean, they get into it and they're just, it's like you can watch it or you can write it. And it's, it's just extremely entertaining because I mean, you have so many personalities and some of the quietest people that play these games, they're the most vibrant and entertaining that you would ever imagine. So when you're playing these games, you're meeting these people. Yes. Is it like a role play situation? Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of, a lot of people, they get, they get into it. Like some of them, actually dress up as their characters um like they have they're some of them are pretty superstitious they have particular dice for particular characters and only those dice work with that characters um and then you have the, the quiet ones i mean they just come in their t-shirt and jeans and they come to play and relax and just de-stress i mean some of them will play in like card shops and stuff like that they'll have back rooms and things um, and people will let you sit in just to be entertained. Um, some people actually have YouTube channels and stuff that they record their games. They are regular people that are acting out these characters. And I mean, unlike on the movie screen, I mean, like, I mean, they're not professional actors, but you can just see them getting very, very into it. That just fascinates me, Nicole. Thank you so much. Javon Johnson is a special needs aide for kids in San Francisco, working toward becoming a clinical psychologist. His book, Forbidden Fruit, started out as an exercise in self-expression that he hopes will help others figure out who they really are. Um, the story is just pretty much, I guess, me trying to understand who I am and why I am and what I am. That's pretty much the whole premise behind all of it. Um, it gives, I guess, this me to understand the world for what it is, I guess in my eyes, and trying to relate to other people that could potentially feel the same way I do. It starts off as me going over some brief experiences I had for like, I think a couple of years. Um, I hit a point when I was 20 years old, I trying to figure out what kind of young man I wanted to be. I started to get rid of some past beliefs I had and started from scratch, just trying to see. I had recently just walked away from my beliefs and my religion. It was more inner conflict of me not really feeling like I believe in God or I had any reason to for myself. Um, it was just those experiences, just trying to walk in that kind of path, but not really finding anything that was meant real to me. So when I walked away, I kind of changed up my entire life, you know, get away from family, those who were a part of the, you know, had the same beliefs. I just completely just walked away from all of it and just started trying to figure out who I am. You know, that's when I got into psychology. I got into philosophy. I started reading more and more, just trying to get a, a general sense of what it means to actually be alive. And after that, I'm talking about various quotes I wrote. Like one of them was, oh, what's a large amount of knowledge to so a small dose of wisdom? Um, I prefer to have more wisdom over knowledge. I feel like it holds a lot more weight when you understand versus knowing everything. That's just a brief example of what you'll see throughout the book. A few experiences I had, how I started the journey, and pretty much why everything started. So by me reading your book, I'm going to figure out who I'm supposed to be. Or who you want to be in a sense, yes. So do you meditate or anything? Like um, <laughs> I actually do. Uh, I, but I, I, for me, meditation is not necessarily about coming and sitting in the quiet space. <laughs> It's just really trying to analyze my own thoughts, you know, find the real reasons behind why I hate, why I love, you know, why I want to go a certain route. Um, and that's what it is for me. It's just really just analyzing my thoughts, trying to get a more of awareness of my unconscious self and digging through even the dirty parts and the good parts of who I am. What's a dirty part of who you are? I guess self-righteousness will be the biggest. Seeing myself more at times, putting my thoughts and feelings of, of, of above everyone else, um, believing that 
well, at one point, I mean, this is kind of like seven years ago when I wrote the book, but um, so a lot has changed since then. But well, mostly just uh, self righteousness at that point when I first started writing. You know, I think a lot of people go through a little bit of that at some point in their lives. The important thing is, you know, you recognize it and you pull yourself out of it. That's what's important. All right. Boy, that show went fast, didn't it? That is a wrap for this edition of the Page Publishing Book Club. Thanks for being here. Hey, check out the books that were featured here and their authors at pagepublishing.com. And uh, pick up copies wherever fine books are sold, online or in stores. Yes, go into a bookstore if you've never been into a bookstore. It's a lot of fun. I still love going into a bookstore. All you need is a little curiosity and a little time. All of our books can be found at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. And if you uh, Google the book you're interested in, you'll find even more outlets to carry them. We are headed into spring, people. Come on. If you're listening to this show, you probably want to write a book or you're curious about the process. And if that's the case, call 888-942-6001, 888-942-6001. And all of your questions will be answered. We really do have a great team here at Page. So, so check us out. That doesn't cost you anything. If you missed anything, just download the podcast at 710WOR.com. We have a new one posted every single week. I'm Alice Stockton-Rossini. I'll catch you next time.